This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, a conversation with Arvind Ethan David. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek, one of the two guys with PhDs talking about comics. And on this interview episode, I have the pleasure of talking with Arvind Ethan David. He is the writer of the current narrative arc of the Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency series. But before we get to that conversation, I want to let all of you guys know that this episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by the wonderful people at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are 20 to 35% off the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials will be at 45% off the cover price. Sometimes they're 50% off cover. But often, you can find discounts that are more impressive than that. And as always, you can find great discounts this month on both single issues as well as comics bundles. You can also find the first trade collection of Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency at 35% off of the cover price. So whether you're looking for great deals on Dirk Gently titles or monthly specials, you can't go wrong by going to the website of Discount Comic Book Service. That's DCBService.com. Go there for all of your comics pre-ordering needs and after you do get your comics there please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with phds sent you i had a great time talking with arvind ethan david he is the writer of dirk gently's holistic detective agency a spoon too short published by idw and at the time of this recording there are three issues out and we can expect two more to come so we talked about that series, but we also talked quite a bit about the road that led Arvind to writing the Dirk Gentry title, and, and that is a very interesting story. Uh, we also talked about how he will soon be helping to bring Dirk Gently to BBC once again. That's a new series that will begin this fall. There's a lot packed into this interview, so let's go ahead and start listening. <music> I have the pleasure of having Arvind Ethan David on the Comics Alternative. He is the writer of the latest series from IDW in the Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency series. This one's called A Spoon Too Short. Arvind, welcome to the Comics Alternative. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. For those who are unfamiliar with the world of Dirk Gently, uh, and that may be a lot of comic book readers, um, how would you go about introducing this title? Dirk is the second great creation of Douglas Adams. Uh, Douglas, best known to most people for creating all the multiple conflicting and complementary versions of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Mm -hmm sort of in between the five books in that, the five books, movie, TV series, radio play in that trilogy, uh, also created this wonderful character, Dirk Gently, and wrote two and a half novels about him. Uh, two and a half, sadly, because Douglas, who died 15 years ago this week, by strange coincidence, he actually, it was the anniversary of his death, two days ago. Uh, he died young at the age of 49, and he was working on the third Dirk Gently novel when he died. So Dirk is, is, comes from the mind that gave you Arthur Dent and Zaphod Beeblebrox and <laughs> Slarty Bart Fast, and he is similar to them and also very, very different. There, he is similar in that he is extraordinary. He is one of, I think, the great 
creations of British comic literature. Uh, but he's different because he's not a spacefaring alien. Uh, he's a detective. Kind of. Sort of. <laughs> uh, Douglas used to say that there's a great tradition of British literary detectives. Dirk Gently does not belong to it. And, and there is, there is there's sort of truth and, uh, in that piece of modesty. Uh, Dirk is a holistic detective, which means he doesn't concern himself with such trivialities as fingerprints or uh, clues in the normal sense. He solves or doesn't solve cases based on the idea of holistic deduction. And the term holistic, he will tell you, refers to his conviction in the fundamental interconnectedness of all things. What this means roughly is that Dirk has a unique relation to the laws of causality and to the universe. He can sense on a deeply instinctual, almost quantum level, the interconnectedness between, say, the flapping of a butterfly's wings in New South Wales and a tsunami across the world. And he, he solves mysteries, not because he's particularly brilliant or diligent or brave. He is none of those things, but because he can't help himself. Like a, to keep to our uh, insect metaphor, like a moth to a flame, he senses when things aren't quite right and can't help but go towards them, uh, even if it is likely to end up with him getting in all sorts of trouble and nearly killed, which it normally does. Hmm. Well, you know, I was not aware that it was almost exactly 15 years ago that Douglas Adams passed. But I guess in the nature of interconnectedness, uh, that's rather fortuitous. Uh, it's uh, Yes. I mean, <laughs> uh, well, the, the, t look, the anniversary, I, I tweeted about it uh, when it came up in my calendar that on the, on the anniversary, I was in the middle of of writing the script for the next issue and also spend most of my day in production meetings for the forthcoming TV show of Dirk Gently. And what I said that Douglas, who was a lifelong devout, if that's the word, atheist, uh, is achieving the only sort of afterlife that he would want, which is, <laughs> which is, which is through his work and through his enduring uh, sort of creative gifts to us all. Well, you know, one of the reasons why I wanted you to introduce Dirk Gently to our listeners is, you know, many will be familiar with Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. That's everywhere. Uh, you know, that's almost as prolific as Star Wars, if not, you know, as prolific uh, as that franchise. But I have found, or maybe I'm just thinking about my own experience, that as much as I know about the Hitchhiker's Guide... I have heard about Dirk Gently, but I, I have not read any of those novels, uh, you know, the two and the one that was published posthumously. And so I, in reading the Dirk Gently comics, which, which started to, to be serialized last year from IDW, uh, just started to introduce myself to that property. So there may be many listeners out there who, you know, are big fans of Hitchhiker's Guide, but just haven't gotten around to Dirk Gently. Now, now why do you think that Dirk Gently may not have the same kind of resonance as Hitchhiker's Guide? I think, well, I, I obviously hope it will, and we're, we're bringing Dirk to all sorts of new audiences through the comics and, and the TV show. I think when, I think it's, it's often the case when a creator has a ginormous you know, sort of phenomenon hit that nothing they can do after will ever achieve the same level of notoriety or pop cultural impact. It's, it's hard to think of many creators who have done it twice at that level, as you say. George Lucas will always be Star Wars. I mean, he's made many other films, but who remembers THX or the Tuskegee Airmen? You know, those are not, uh, they're not bad films, but they're not what George Lucas is going to be remembered for. Uh, Arthur, Conan uh, Arthur Conan Doyle spent a lot of his career being furious that all he was known for was Sherlock Holmes, which he regarded as a relatively 
uh, inferior subclass of his work. Uh, J.M. Barry, I think, would be turning in his grave if he thought that all he's remembered for was Peter Pan when he was at the time one of the most acclaimed playwrights, satirists, essayists, and novelists uh, of his generation. So I don't think, I don't think uh, Dirk is, I don't think there's anything about Dirk not being resonant. And indeed, it sold something like three or four million books. So that, by normal standards, is a huge success. But when you contrast it to the monolith that is Hitchhikers, which sold upwards of 20, of 20 million books and obviously spawned many, many spin-offs, then it just seems small by comparison. But I think, you know, but I think we should be clear by, by sort of normal mortal standards, a, a series that sold uh, three or four million books that has already been a successful, if short-lived, BBC British series uh, starring, Stephen, starring Stephen Mangan, and now uh, with, with, with me being this new comic book series and the new TV series, I, I think it will, it will make its impact. But I think that's basically the reason. It's, it's great, and it's sort of reasonably well-known in, uh, in the overall context of things, but just next to Hitchhikers, it's hard to, it's hard to see the moon for the sun. Right, and, and that's a good point. Now, I want to talk to you uh, in a moment about what you're doing with the TV series, uh, what we have coming up in the near future. But first I want to ask how you came about writing this narrative arc of Dirk Gently for IDW. So there is both a long answer and a short answer to this question. Having, having heard uh, a few of your past interviews, I'm guessing you won't mind the long answer because that's the joy. Is that, is that fair? Exactly. We, we, we enjoy those long responses. So let me do it chronologically uh about 21 years ago uh i adapted dirt gently as a student play uh, i actually adapted it first at high school and then uh but that sort of didn't count because uh, we, we didn't so much adapt it as just was were 15 at it but then a couple of years later at at college i adapted it properly and and I played Dirt Gently, and I directed it, and 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 co-wrote it with my friend James Goss. And in a sort of wonderful teenage miracle, Douglas Adams came to see it. And huh. if you've ever had one of those moments, which I imagine you have, because of what you do, when you get to sit down with a with a someone whose work you venerate and who is a hero to you, that was both scary and wonderful and obviously made more terrifying by the fact that I wasn't just sitting down to him but he was watching my teenage adaptation of of this extraordinary novel and then we got to have dinner afterwards and he was incredibly kind and and complimentary about it and that started it started two things really or three things it started my career in a very straightforward sense because when a giant tells you that you're quite good at writing and producing and making stuff you decide that maybe you should give it a go i mean i was supposed to be a lawyer at that point that was the path that you know i thought i was on and my parents thought i was on but i think that that night over dinner douglas adams changed that and i <laughs> became a storyteller and that's that's that that was one starting of on that evening the second the second thing that started was and i don't want to call it a friendship that's to overstate it i he was a hugely important person in my life in the seven years between us meeting and his death i was a very minor person in his life but we did have a very friendly uh, acquaintance we had dinner a couple of times a year we would get together at uh, various events and he introduced me to all his partners and collaborators who uh, were then and are now a kind of pantheon of extraordinary creators and storytellers and thinkers from Richard Dawkins to John Cleese to 
um, the founders of Wired magazine, to Nathan Murfrod, to Steve Wozniak. I mean, Douglas was uh, a sort of luminary in the pop intellectual community of the of the 80s and 90s. And I got, at, as a teenager and as a young adult in my 20s, I got put in that world. And that was a, a gift, a gift beyond all imagining. And the third thing that started was my really lifelong, therefore, obsession to one day do dirt gently right, to do it, to do it better than I had done it at college. And that was a road with many uh, stops and pauses and life happens and uh, my career went in other directions and I made a bunch of movies and theater and the other things that I've done in my life. But about two years ago, just over two years ago, I was at a wedding and at my table was a gentleman called Ed Victor, now, Ed, Ed is a giant in the British publishing, publishing scene. He is sort of the original super agent in, 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 in England. And he had been, for many years, Douglas's agent and one of Douglas's best friends. Huh. And he turned to me and he went, Arvin David, I remember you. And Ed, of course, also has known me since I was 17 because he came to that production that Douglas did. And that's why Douglas – well, actually, he came first. And then when he saw it, he told Douglas he had to come. And um, he said, I remember you. Dirt gently. Why don't you do something with it? I think the time has come and we have the rights back. And the estate would like to do something and you should be the one. And it was like, yes, please. It was, <laughs> you know, it was like being tapped on the shoulder by the dead hand of Douglas Adams. It actually gets even weirder than this. The, the wedding we were at was uh, the marriage of uh, my friend Nandana Sen, the, the actress and activist, to a gentleman called John Mackinson. Now, I didn't know John particularly well. Uh, Nandana is a very dear friend, and uh, she had recently, it had been a sort of world, world, whirlwind romance, and I was meeting her husband properly for the first time at the wedding. And after the ceremony... Uh, he and I are standing, it was in the Hamptons, and we were standing on the on the cliff overlooking the beach and sharing a quiet moment and getting to know each other. And he had been married previously. His wife had died many years ago. Uh, and he, see, he was looking sad. And I said, oh, what are you thinking about? And he said, well, I'm thinking that the man who was best man at my first wedding isn't here today. And I said, oh, who's that? Douglas Adams. <laughs> so more interconnectedness more interconnectedness so that's how i come to be writing this series of comic books and uh and that's i'm afraid uh the sort of medium long version okay so the this first narrative arc in the idw series uh doug gently's holistic detective agency the interconnectedness of all kings was written by Chris Royale and and illustrated or penciled by both Tony Atkins and Ilias and correct me if I'm mispronouncing the the, the last name uh, Criasis Criasis exactly so. oh oh I got it correct um so so they were the team for the first arc at what point uh did you know that you were going to be the writer for this new narrative arc a spoon too short well they. I edited that that arc, so it was a fun collaboration from the start. I had never written a comic book, so I didn't sort of want to presuppose that I should be the one writing it. Most of my writing works for the theater and 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 and, and a little bit for the screen but but because I was sort of the custodian of the brand and the the representative of the Adams estate in this picture, IDW asked me to edit the book. And Chris Ryle, who's a very gifted writer, uh, I think his um, Groom Lake series and his uh, Robots vs. Zombie series are both you know, fantastic and, and, and will last, uh, was very generous in his collaboration. And we ended up working pretty closely together uh, on that first arc and I enjoyed it very much. And as he was finishing up 
the final issue of that, we were at dinner at Comic-Con and we were talking about what should happen next. And he said, well, I think it's time for a new creative team. And, and we started talking about who. And at some point in the conversation, he said, well, what about you? And I was, it was again one of those moments where I just went, yes. <laughs> yes, that is correct. That is a correct suggestion. Thank you. And then I got to learn how to write comics. But it was lucky, I think, for me to have had the experience of editing his arc. Because both, both because I got to learn in general terms how comics are put together from the inside. You know, as a lifelong comic consumer and fan and, and uh, enthusiast, I've you know, read thousands and thousands and thousands of comics, but that's, of course, not the same. And it's the first thing to, that I tell you know, anyone who's approaching a creative medium, just because you've been to the symphony doesn't mean you can write one. <laughs> and, but having had the experience over that first arc of really from the inside of sitting with Chris on many Skype calls like this one and, and many uh, e email exchanges over many months, breaking the story, uh, watching him uh, evolve the scripts from draft to draft, giving notes on the scripts, watching the art get drawn, giving notes on the art, uh, understanding the interplay between writer and artist and, and editor and colorist and letterer, uh, I felt a little more comfortable having a go. And, and, and then specifically, I, if whilst I'm still, and, and I'm loving it and I'm doing more of it, but I'm still a newbie to the comic world, but I guess the thing that I, that I do have expertise in is in adapting Dirk Gently <laughs> because I've spent on and off a lot of time from a very young age living with this character and understanding the challenges of adapting Douglas's ideas for different mediums. And that gave me a little bit of confidence. Yeah, so this is just a natural project for you. Dirk is a character, and I think all writers find in their lives characters that just fit, that aren't difficult to write. There are times when you're staring at the blank page and it's a challenge. But sometimes you find a character, and for me, it's Dirk, that is never hard to write. I always know what Dirk's going to say or do in any given circumstance uh, because I've known him a long time. He's a very dear friend, and there are days that I'm not entirely sure where he ends and I begin, and that's... That's okay. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things I really appreciate that you do at the very beginning of the, A Spoon Too Short is you, you give a larger narrative context. And so I, I, right now I'm looking at the very first page of this first issue of the miniseries, and you say that this takes place after Long Dark Tea Time of the Soul, which is, you know, the last Dirk Gently book while Adams was alive, but before the events in the previous narrative arc of, in the comics, the interconnectedness of all kings, and, and, and then, of course, the upcoming TV series. And so this is, I guess, kind of in some ways uh, a prequel to the previous arc or an in-between story, but, but more importantly, what you're doing is you're really fleshing out the world of Dirk Gently in ways that, unfortunately, Adams never had the time to do, uh, you know, in, to, to any, you know, full extent. Uh, so are there... Or do you have any tentative plans, let's say, outside of the new TV series, which, again, I want to talk about in a bit, uh, of more Dirk Gently stories in comics after yes. Spoon Too Short? Yes, is the short answer. Uh, <laughs> it's a the, – the great thing about the detective form, the genre, is it's case-based. Mm -hmm. And it – its sort of highest expression, you know, for, for you know, it's a rare case where the the most perfect example of it 
is one of the first of it, and it's it's Sherlock, of course. And Sherlock wasn't the first detective story. The first detective story uh, is probably uh, Edgar Allan Poe's uh, Dupin. Dupin, yeah. yeah. But Sh- Sherlock comes very shortly after, and in fact, to some extent, is a response to Conan Doyle read the Dupin stories and th- thought, more or less, I can do better, and set about proving it. And the joy of the of the case format is you can tell self-contained tales that have a finite length and are satisfying to pay off in themselves. But if you want to get ambitious, then in doing that, you also think about how to grow and evolve the character and how to deepen and widen the overall mythology and the overall world and the books give us clues but as you say there's sadly only two of them or two in the fragment and we'll talk i want to talk about the fragment in a minute but that's not quite enough in itself but the great thing is therefore there's space what douglas leaves us with is an extraordinary character the uh, uh, an amazing tone and an amazing sort of approach to how stories could be told and how Dirk investigates mysteries, which is different from any other detective ever created. But then he gives us space, tons of space. They are clues in the books that Dirk's childhood was irregular. There's a fantastic throwaway line that he grew up on the smarter side of Transylvania. But what does that mean? He he hints uh, that his mother had needed expensive dental work being from the smarter side of Transylvania. So is he descended from vampires? He denies being psychic, but clearly has something that if not psychic is something like psychic he gets arrested and disappears for years before resurfacing he isn't called Dirk Gently his real name is Svlad Celli so there are these clues that Douglas gives us in the books and for a fan And for a fan who's a writer, those clues are just glorious invitations to go and doodle, to go and embroider, to to, to fill in the gaps in the map, to invent new chapters that plug the the chronology, and to try and explain. And for me, the fun fun thing we're doing uh, in both the comics and the TV show um, is starting to go, where does this extraordinary man come from? Where does this gift of his come from and how does it affect him what does it mean to have an unerring sense of interconnectedness but bizarrely to end up extremely isolated from normal relationships because of it how does the world's most interconnected man also become the world's most lonely man and those are all questions that are hinted at in the books but what we're doing in the comics is uh, to dive deeper into them, and so you'll see, and you know, you've, you've drawn attention to the sort of opening sections of each of the comics. Each of them, in in a in a sp- in a spoon too short, gives us a little flashback to Dirk's childhood or, or his adolescence, and maybe these are part of a bigger narrative. Maybe they're not. <laughs> we'll see, and and hopefully readers will come along for the ride as we discover that. So I think it's great that you're taking a cue from the clues that Adam puts in his original Dirk Gently narratives and giving us uh, a little background about him. Now, you mentioned that, I mean, this is definitely in the comics. In fact, each of the three issues of A Spoon Too Short that have come out so far begin with a little bit, a few pages, about Dirk's past as a kid. Uh, You say you're going to do the same thing with the new TV series? I don't want to tease too much of what's going to happen in the new TV series, but yes, there is a... I think it's impossible to tell a long-form story 
about a really complex character without hinting at least at the backstory. And so, yes, the TV show will continue to hint at how Dirk's childhood uh, impacted who he is. That said, it's we're not taking a a sort of strict canonical approach to this. Not they don't all they're not all the same thing. The way Max and I, Max Landis, uh, is uh, my friend, the screenwriter and and lead writer of the TV series. The way he and I talk about the comics, which uh, he's executive producing, is that the comics are because the comics are narrated by Dirk. The comics are the versions of events that Dirk would like to tell you. And Dirk is not necessarily a completely reliable narrator. So the Dirk of the comics is probably a tiny bit more suave and a ti- comes out a tiny bit better than the Dirk that you might see without the filter of his own narration. Now, okay, so what can you tell us about this upcoming BBC series? It's... I can tell you a couple of fun things. Well, I'm actually I'm speaking to you from Vancouver, where we are f- about to start filming it. Oh, great! So, 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 and I'm I'm looking out at the sunny Vancouver skyline. It uh, will star uh, Sam Barnett, who's a rather brilliant young British actor, uh, recently nominated for uh, a Tony Award for some Shakespeare uh, as the new Dirk Gently. And we think Sam is going to be an extraordinary Dirk Gently. And it will also star Elijah Wood as a new character, a character who's not in the books huh. or, or the comics, and a character called Todd, who sort of Dirk wants Todd to be his Watson, <laughs> but Todd isn't having any of it. <laughs> Todd is a guy who, in his own words, is his own messed up person, and he's not, I'm not your Watson asshole, is one of his more memorable lines. <laughs> and uh, it also star- stars uh, Hannah Marks, wonderful actress, as Todd's sister, Amanda, and a whole bunch of wonderful, really extraordinary actors whom we haven't announced yet, but we will be over the coming weeks. And it's written, uh, or lead written, by Max Landis, and Max is a extraordinary writer. He is best known uh, in the feature world for his movie Chronicle, uh, and and more recently for movies uh, like American Ultra, and st- starring Jesse Eisenberg and Kirsten Stewart and Mr. Wright. And he he and I have been friends for a little while. And when I got that tap on the shoulder that it was time to do Dirk. He was really the only person I thought of. You know, he was the only person, kind of, other than myself, without sounding whatever that might sound like, <laughs> who I would trust to take Douglas's voice and this character into new mediums. And he's done an extraordinary job and continues to do an extraordinary job. We're still deep in the writing of it, as well as about to be in the shooting of it. And uh, it will hit the world later this year. Oh, great. Um, it, it's interesting you were talking about Elijah Wood as the, I guess, reluctant assistant. This is this is a theme that I find coming up in the two comic uh, series or the two narrative arcs we have so far. What uh, Chris Ryle wrote is the character Tanya uh, yes. wanting to be the associate. He, yes. At first he corrects her, an assistant. Yes. And then in your uh, Spoon Too Short, we have Tamasha who is a character who has no intentions of being an assistant, but Dirk refers to as an assistant slash customer or yes. client. Client. Uh, the assist, assist client. Assist client. Um, well, Dirk, I mean, this all comes back to kind of what Dirk is. Dirk isn't really a detective, at least in the sense of you would expect a detective to have methods and offices and paying clients. And Dirk has some of those things some of the time. (laughs) And so he's always a sort of intention in search of actuality. He intends to be a detective. And so he is very keen to acquire an assistant because directors, sorry, detectives should have assistants. 
And unfortunately, he seldom has any money to pay them, uh, nor a cohesive case for them to assist on. And so he sort of co-ops people. And Dirk is at his best when he's co-opting people, because he is, whilst he, on one sense, he's a train wreck of a man, in another sense, he's incredibly charismatic and incredibly compelling. And you don't really know, you sort of suspect he's a lunatic and it's all nonsense, but about every seventh sentence, about every seventh minute, he says something so astonishing and so in- and so interesting and so impossible to know that you're intrigued and you follow him. Mm. You know, uh, well, he always also makes references in terms of assistance to companions in Doctor Who. And interestingly enough, and correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't Dirk gently have its has its genesis in Doctor Who? To a point. To look to a to a significant point. No, you're completely correct. The history is interesting. Uh, Douglas Adams, in between writing the first and maybe the second Hitchhiker's novel, or I think just after the first, actually, after the first, took a stint running Doctor Who. Uh, it was uh, the very early 80s. And it's what we would, in America, call the showrunner job. In the, the UK at that time, they didn't really call it that. They, it had the much less glamorous title of script editor, but it was not what that sounds like. A script editor is a very junior job in American television, but it really was the sort of lead writer and the guy who, who was in charge of the series uh, for a few years. And in that time, he wrote what is generally regarded as one of the best Doctor Who story arcs of all time. Uh, he wrote an arc called The City of Death. Uh, which takes place in Paris. Uh, it's a Tom Baker, Doctor Who um, arc, and it's a wonderfully complicated and quite brilliant uh, story. He also wrote a arc called Shada. And then something went wrong. Uh, in this arc called Shada, in which the Doctor goes to Cambridge and meets up with a retired Time Lord, and they embark on a time-traveling adventure. That, that, that story arc, I forget how many episodes it was going to be, never got made. It never got finished. And I think there was either a strike or a fire or both, either an, either an industrial accident or an act of God. And production got shut down, and that's, that, that story never got made. Those scripts never got filmed until many years later. But at the time, then Douglas left Doctor Who, and he was you know, looking about in his hard drive for an idea for a new novel, and he found the old Shada scripts. And he thought, oh, maybe there's a way to use some of these ideas. And he started rewriting, and what came out of them is Dirk Gently, is the first Dirk Gently novel. And the retired Time Lord stays pretty much unchanged. His name is Professor Regius Chronotus, uh, or Reg Chronotus, the Regius Professor of Chronology at Sense, at Sense, Sense College, Cambridge, which is a fictional college loosely based on Douglas's own college, St. John's. And he is a immortal time traveler who is so old that he's forgotten what he used to do before he retired. Uh, something pretty good, he thinks. <laughs> and uh, he has this time machine, and he goes on occasional missions, not even missions, he uses the time machine principally to catch up with television, because he's never quite got the hand of a video recorder, let alone a DVR. And so he pops back to watch you know, episodes of his favorite shows, and occasionally to do groceries or catch up on some reading. And the the Doctor character is replaced by this insane detective. And so Dirk is kind of the bastard half-son of Doctor Who, which is kind of great. He's very different from the Doctor. He's a much more human character, 
and more damaged in many ways, but he shares the Doctor's enthusiasms. Like the Doctor, he is passionate about many things, often contradictory things at the same time. And he shares the Doctor's, and this is, I think, comes back to your question, he shares the Doctor's ability to make you want to follow him, mm-hmm. to, be, to, to be his assistant or his companion, and to embark on adventure, not quite sure why or if it's wise, or being reasonably certain it's not wise, but you go anyway. Well, I really like that throughout the Dirk Gently comic book series, there are these references to Doctor Who that are peppered slightly throughout. Uh, I really appreciate that. Well, there's a real, you know, it, it's nice to acknowledge the debt, and and it's a debt that we are that we're repaying. And I do it. I do it with Doctor Who, and there's also references to hitchhikers in there. And look, I'm a fan. I'm a you know I'm a fanboy who's lucky enough to now get to make stuff that has fans. And so I, I can't not continue to be a fan just because I happen to be a creator too. Mm. Well, you know, coming back to the comics, now, you know, you have a lot of experience writing and producing across different media, uh, and you, you have experience, you're a qualified solicitor. Uh, so I'm wondering, in, in writing this current story and, and editing the previous Dirk Gentry arc, um, how you brought those skills and those, those experiences and, and those points of view to your creation of Dirk Gently? I'm not sure the solicitor bit is getting much use in. <laughs> Even though in, we're dealing with law to some degree? <laughs> that's a good point. I, I tell you what is, it's, there are a couple of interesting things. In the actual process of writing comics, the closest thing, you know, for me in thinking about a comic is thinking about film and TV. Mm-hmm. And it is obviously similar and different and you know you are an expert on this but the difference of you know sequential art is not the moving picture so thinking about but thinking about cuts thinking about camera angles thinking about um the juxtaposition of images and cutting between one scene and another uh thinking about how to employ flashback uh thinking about different visual styles those are those are more or less second nature to me so transposing that to comics is it's not easy but it's i i have i have analogous experience what's enormously exciting about writing comics which is different is i get to take many more decisions i get to be in charge of many more things <laughs> because in a film world or a tv world you are collaborating writer producer director cinematographer you know at, at, at in the core and then every other head of department and if there is you know and depending on what it is they might you know the the director may be the lead voice the showrunner or writer may be the lead voice but it's still a collaboration and you're dependent upon many skill sets and many different people and an enormous amount of time gets spent communicating a shared vision. In comics, it's you and the artist. And and I'm very lucky in Ilias, who I've never met. It's one of the weird things about our interconnected global world. <laughs> Ilias lives in Athens. Uh, he's Greek. Uh, I'm Malaysian, Indian, British, and I live in Los Angeles. We have never met, and we've been collaborating for a year now, and our, we've both just signed up to do another year, so... We, and it's a very intimate, creative relationship, but we've never met. And we've indeed, I don't think we've spoken once, like on Skype. Everything we do, we do on email. Wow. And and, and through the scripts. Uh, and so, uh, and we should talk about that, but, but just to finally try and answer your question, the others, the way I think about it is I get to flex fully lots of muscles that I only get to flex slightly in my other jobs. So I am the writer. I'm also the director. <laughs> I am dictating the camera angles. I'm dictating the cuts. Uh, and I say dictating. What's happened very quickly with Elias is that 
a shorthand has emerged, and increasingly he's making a lot of those decisions. So, I mean, I write, I mean, just to give you an example, I, I've only ever written in Final Draft, which is the screenwriting uh, you know, software program that most screenwriters use. I literally don't know how to write a script in any other... I can't write it on Word. My brain refuses to write dialogue in Word. I just <laughs> can't. I, I look at it and I freeze. So my comic scripts look like film scripts. And I'm lucky that Ilias and IDW are not dogmatic about that. I think some publishers, Marvel and DC, I think DC particularly, will just not allow that. You have to deliver comic script in the comic script format as a word document in a particular way. And I would be in trouble if I tried to do that because I, I, I don't know how. And when it came to you know, the very start of the collaboration, they are comic book writers who will prescribe with enormous precision the, the, not just the number of panels, but their size, their respective positioning and layouts and shape and the direction of the movement. And I, it's interesting. When I started, I more or less said, guys, I don't know how to do that. I can give you words and I could specify that they should be panels. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we need panels. <laughs> um, but you're going to have to help me out here. And, and over the first few issues, Ilyas and I and our editor, Denton Tipton, sort of developed a way to help me. And, and now I have found, I think, a good balance where I, I give enough direction so that I'm getting what I want and Ilyas is getting enough guidance, but he has increasing uh, latitude to 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 reinterpret and, and make decisions himself. So, it's a it's a both a very fluid, but also very contained fluidity because it's just the two of us. Ultimately, we're not having, unlike in a film or a TV show or a theater project, we're not having to contend with sixteen other heads of department and twenty actors, all of whom with their own interpretations. Now, that's a joy. Don't get me wrong, and it makes things often, you know, immeasurably better, but it's also exhausting and takes a lot of manager, managerial and producerial energy to keep on track. And so there's a sort of purity to two guys and their computers in Athens and Los Angeles getting to make all the decisions. And for me, that's been the most illuminating and different thing from all the other jobs I've done, uh, all the other types of writing and storytelling I've done compared to to writing for comics. So you're getting your comics writing chops with Dirk Gently, and uh, Spoon Too Short is your first attempt at writing a comic, but you have something else that you're going to be coming out with in the future, uh, a title that you're working on with Mike Carey, correct? That is correct. Uh, it's called Darkness Visible um, from the Milton, from from Paradise Lost, and as that might suggest, it has a little bit to do with demons. And we, today, actually, about an hour ago, we delivered the first script to IDW and uh, to Denton. I, I have the same editor on both books, and uh, I don't yet know what he thinks of it. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but Mike and I uh, had a lot of fun writing it. Uh, we've been friends... Uh, uh, for a long time, and collaborators on a number of film and TV projects that sadly haven't yet to see light of day. But we've been we've so enjoyed working together, and this was an idea that started its life as a film idea. And after the film didn't happen, we both still really loved the idea, and we thought, well, let's let's go to comics, and we've totally reinvented it. It is now rather different from the film idea, but we think it's better for it, and we think it will make a really interesting comic series. And I think it will come out, the first issue comes out in November, so a little while away. Uh, the lead times in comics, whilst shorter than some things, are still, you know, some months. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a lot of fun. And working with Mike, you know, I, we've just been talking about how I'm a novice. Uh, Mike's a grandmaster. I mean, the man's been nominated for more Eisner's 
than uh, than I have than I've written comics <laughs> yeah. by by some significant factor. And you've mentioned demons. If anybody knows how to about to write about demons in comics, it's definitely Mike Carey. Completely, because of his work on Lucifer, uh, and you know, we talk about how uh, we talked earlier about how every writer finds a character that just does the work for them. And for me, it's Dirk. And Mike has said that for him, it was Lucifer. And and actually, I look at Mike's career as a comic writer. Uh, he's now also a very significant novelist and screenwriter, but he started his career in comics. And we joke that we're sort of going in opposite directions because he's spent sort of 20 years as a, as a comic book writer and now is spending more time in, uh, in the movie world. And I've spent about 20 years in the movie world and uh, now starting to spend time in comics. Uh, he thinks I'm an idiot, by the way. He's like, why would you do that? <laughs> but, but I'm having fun. But the thing that, and, and when I started writing Dirk, I called him for his advice because there's some strange parallels because I was sort of stepping into Douglas Adams' shoes and taking his wonderful creation on new adventures. And that was the start of my comic writing career. And Mike with Lucifer, which was really his first significant comic job, was stepping into Neil Gaiman's shoes yeah. and, and, and taking Neil's creation on new adventures, and to go back to the interconnectedness of all things, Neil started his career, and literally the first published book is a biography of Douglas Adams. <laughs> Jeez. This is becoming uncanny. It, it, it is. It is, uh, it is glorious. And, and, and I think it goes back to, you know, Dirk is about the interconnectedness of all things, and that's an idea that Douglas was 20 years ahead of the curve on. Mm -hmm. um, Douglas, who was a very early adopter of the internet and email, was an Apple evangelist, uh, was friends with the founders of both Apple and Microsoft, um, saw what the internet would do long before the internet did it. And Dirk is sort of like a one-man hyperlink. <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. And, and so whilst it is surprising in a wonderful, gratifying way to see all these interconnections come to play, in another sense, it's not surprising at all. It's just proof that Douglas was right. Mm-hmm. Okay, so how many more issues of A Spoon Too Short do we have? Issues one, two, and three are already out now. So A Spoon Too Short will have five issues. Okay. So it will end in July, and then there'll be a collected edition coming out in September. And I've just been looking at the proof of that, and it looks kind of glorious. Um, and then in October we're starting the next case, which is going to be called The Salmon of Doubt. Yes, The Salmon of Doubt. Uh, I should say, I, do, I didn't come up with either of these two titles. Douglas did. They were the two working titles for the third unfinished Dirk Gently novel that was sitting on his hard drive when he died. And... I haven't taken, I haven't taken the fragment. I didn't want to, literally, step into his keyboard. Uh, I've taken a couple of ideas from it. There is a rhinoceros in it, uh, and there is a rhinoceros's nose in it. Um, but I have taken the titles, and I've tried to make that my little homage, uh, homage, and and find ways to make stories that make sense of those titles. So, uh, uh, Spoon to Short stops in uh, July, we have August off, then trade edition in September, and then a new case in October. But the new case, whilst a new case, will be a continuing adventure. It, 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 it starts immediately after the events of Spoon to Short, and, uh, and uh, continues with a few of the characters who we've met there, but it also brings in some new characters, and it also goes back to some 
very loved characters from the books. Well, do you have any plans of taking Dirk's story into, I guess, more contemporary uh, setting where we have him in San Diego in the interconnectedness of all kings? The, uh, the television series is set in America. Okay. And you'll see that some of the flashbacks are also in America in the comics. And they may be some interconnectedness at work there. Okay, so you have the next narrative arc of the comic coming out in October, beginning in October. You yes. have Darkness Visible will begin in November. Yes. And again, when can we expect the beginning of the BBC series? We don't have an exact date yet, but it will be either the end of this year or early next year. So all, you know, I think we'll be seeing a fourth quarter tsunami of darkness. <laughs> I like the way you put that. Well, Arvind, Arvind, you're a very busy man uh, with, with Dirk Gently taking up, uh, it, it seems to be the, uh, the lion's share of your time, but, but it sounds fun. I, I thank you very much for being on the Comics Alternative. Uh, I highly recommend your uh, narrative, A Spoon Too Short. It, it, and one of the great things about this is you don't have to have read the earlier Interconnectedness of All Kings in order to appreciate A Spoon Too Short. No, I think that's right. Um, they are going to bring out, I think in October as well, a sort of special edition that has both arcs that will have uh, the interconnectedness of all kings and a spoon to a shot all together. So if you want to read them all together, you can do that then, but you don't need to. Each each case tells its own story, and and Chris's Dirk and my Dirk are 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 similar, but they're not the same. And that's part of the fun as well. Wow. Even, even more Dirk to spread around. Indeed. Yeah. Arvind, thanks a lot for the conversation. Derek, thank you. It's been a pleasure. So there you have it, my conversation with Arvind Ethan David. I had a great time talking with him about his current IDW title and his future title with Mike Carey, as well as the upcoming BBC adaptation of Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency. Uh, I also want to thank other people who helped to make this interview possible. Stephen Scott from IDW, he was indispensable, as well as Devin Byers from ID8 Media, and then Case Kelly and Pam Wilson from Inc. Media. Thank you guys for helping to make this interview happen. And if you want to make other things happen, then you would do well to go to the website of our sponsor, Discount Comic Book Service. Go to dcbservice.com, and there you're going to find a lot of great discounts. And in fact, you can find the first trade collection of Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency at 35% off of the cover price. You just can't beat their deals. And after you do get your comics there, get in touch with us and let us know what you think about my conversation with Arvind. If you go to the website, comicsalternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us voice message through SpeakPipe. It's a very simple program to use. Or if you want to be a little more difficult about it, you can pick up the phone and call us the old-fashioned way. Our phone number is 415-3-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. You can also email us. We're two guys at comicsalternative.com, or you can email me directly. I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. You can also find us on Twitter. We're at the number two guys with PhDs, and we really do appreciate all of you guys out there who continue to retweet our tweets. It shows us that you care. You can also find us on other social media outlets such as Facebook. Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, and YouTube. You can subscribe to the podcast through iTunes, and when you do, please leave us a rating and review. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can find us on TuneIn. You can also get us on Spotify, and if you're an Android user, Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our episodes, as well as the reviews and the comics-related commentary that we post on our blog. And that's by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. We have a lot of other interviews lined up for the coming weeks, so be sure to check back later. And until then, take care.